Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Sound Horizons podcast brought to you by Track. I'm Rick, and although it's not the reason you tuned in, it certainly doesn't hurt. Hey, today's guest is another amazing human. I know. You're thinking, how many amazing humans does Track know? Answer, all of them. Regardless <laughs> whether you are in step or in line with us or not, if you don't know who today's guest is, I don't know where you've been living, and I don't want to know. I'm just going to get right to it. We all know how I feel about weird, awkward transitions like the one I'm involved in right now. Ladies and gentlemen, please click your keyboards and your fingers and whatever you do on the internet for your friend and mine, Mr. Frank Filippetti. Mr. Frank Filippetti. <laughs> <laughs> there it is. And the stadium goes wild. It's, That's uh, right. It's wonderful to have you here today, sir. It's wonderful to be here. So this is one of those uh, situations where I'm I'm fairly certain throughout the course of your career, you've answered all the questions, you've talked about all the stuff. So I am going to do us both a favor of just jumping in head first with the good stuff, if that's okay You're with right. you. That's fine with me. So at some point in time in your amazing, illustrious career that we will touch on, you decide to become involved in, interested in, and kind of really associated with, uh, at various different stages, immersive sound, starting with 5-1. Right. So how, is that a natural organic interest or transition for you? Because you, you've been doing it since it was, pop, you know, since before it was like the standard or popular. You were, you were there at the right. very beginning. How, do, how, do, how did that happen? Well, I was... Uh... Let me see. Uh, I guess the I had just finished uh, the Hourglass album. Okay. And um, I believe that was my first, I think, uh, uh, immersive. And at that time, you know, there was a lot of talk about DVD audio, 5.1 DVD audio. Okay. So I said, you know what? Uh, to the folks at Sony, let's let me do a five-one uh, version for DVD audio, which they were very happy to do. Um, it was a it was kind of a nightmare because back <laughs> then you didn't have. I had uh, I set up six stereo D to A's. I believe I was using the. Uh, the 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 blues um, anyway we they were all stereo but the problem was at that point in time there wasn't a you couldn't clock them together synchronizing them together was very difficult jeez so uh a friend of mine david smith who passed uh, way too soon but was a brilliant uh engineer uh technician kind of guy built a clock that we could use to lock up all of the uh, devices. Wow. And I don't know how he did it or what he did, but it came out great. Um, so we, we, that was my first attempt was, uh, at, uh, James Taylor hourglass five, one, it came out actually on a DSD multi-channel, but it was mixed in in standard five one and then we converted it over to dsd because at that point in time there was no way to do a dsd uh 5.1 but um we did that and uh, it sounded great work great and then i started working james had done a uh was going to wanted to record a concert at the beacon theater um around that time and uh i recorded it and uh we did that in 5.1 as well and that came out really terrific it's called james taylor live at the beacon but um uh the sad part about that uh it was great doing it but the sad part was the, the week before the concert carlos vega yeah. who was James's drummer and, and the most amazing drummer, uh, he died. Yeah. And, um, Steve Jordan mm. was able to fill in and he was incredible. I mean, he learned all those songs, did all that work in less than five days. And, uh, 
he did an incredible job. So with the armed with the experience of doing the the hourglass mix before you went to do this broadcast, did you change your approach to recording anything, kind of knowing I, where the end result was going to be with that little bit yeah. of experience? Yeah, I put up, uh, um, normally we put up two, maybe four audience mics, for example, when we're recording a stereo show, but, uh, I put up like 10 microphones in the audience and, uh, then some surround microphones on the stage. So it was, it was meant to, you know, the idea was this is going to be in five one and okay. it still holds up today. So people love it. Do, was it difficult or challenging? It, it, some of the stuff you did, you were remixing previous works, things that were already recorded for 5-1. Yeah, bad out and, of hell and things right. like that. Yeah. And they were never recorded with the thought that they might ever yeah. be. In, so is there a, a kind of a, a weird mental challenge or, or faculty and sort of, for you anyway, trying to make those records still musical without, you know, again, to your point, when there's a crowd and there's an audience, maybe there's a little bit more natural ambiance for a five one but when you're doing something that's just straight stereo mix and now they're going to make it all around you how do you wrap your head around that as uh, from an artistic standpoint well the idea is to take the essence of what the stereo mix is in terms of effects delays um type of room is it a, a big room is it a small room you know and you work on whatever that mentality was when it was originally put together then starting from there you have to realize that the delays now you have to spread it out across and in, in this case uh, 11 speakers mm. and so the concept here is you not only have to do your standard set of delays which kind of match what was done on the original but then you also have to bring them around and you don't just want to take uh you know copy it to the the heights or anything what you sure. end up doing is building that stereo room into an immersive room mm. by using additional reverbs and things like that so that when something hits when the vocal hits a uh a point where the reverbs really take over it doesn't sound like it's coming from one spot in the room but it sounds like it's in the room mm -hmm. so so that's so you have other than that though you then um you then just kind of play it by ear you know place things where you think they make the most sense uh, a lot of controversy on that uh <laughs> there's a lot of controversy even on how people set up for example, I have what I would call an Oro 3D room. And what that means is, um, uh, I don't see, I don't know. You, well, you can see one speaker there. Sure. Yeah. That's my, that's my left rear speaker. Uh, I have five of those. Those are JBL M2s. Okay. And so I have a left, a center, a right, a left surround, and a right surround with the M2s. Uh, then I have a side fill here, which is the JBL uh, 708, mm. okay? And the same thing on the other side. So my, and then I have the four height speakers, uh, which I don't know if you can see, let's see if I go. Yeah, there you go. There's wow. the height. Yeah. I have four of those. Those are the JBL 705s. So the concept, uh, is in my room, my left and right and left surround and right surround are at the corners of the room. And then the height speakers are right, are about three feet above those three and a half feet above that room. So it's a big room with, uh, with the height speakers there, they are facing towards you. They're not firing down at you like the Atmos system. Okay. They're also, they're also right above your left and right fronts and rears. So that means that the room is a big, uh, rectangular room as opposed to the Atmos where the, uh, not only are the height speakers 
uh, down firing, but they start about one third of the way from the front. They're not back there at the front. Wow. Again, if you think about it, uh, the, the Atmos system was developed for film. And in film, you don't have your side or surround speaker starting until where the audience sits. Sure. There's no point in putting it up way back behind the top speakers. But what's great for film isn't necessarily great for audio. So mm -hmm. for or for 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 uh, music mixing, I like my room to be the same at the top as it is at the bottom. Sure. Um, and I'm using those top speakers for sound, but also for ambience and so forth. So having them firing down doesn't make any sense. In a film, you have them firing down because you want the helicopter to pan across. Okay. Sure. So. Uh, but you're, it's a different, it's a different way of working. Secondarily, my speakers are 30, zero and minus 30 in the front. And then I'm, uh, 180 and, uh, whatever that is. In other words, I'm, I'm 30 and 30 from the center and the rear as well. So it's, it's a perfectly concentric room. Um, the Oro uh, 3D system recommends the side speakers at 110, as does Dolby, but I don't like that. Hmm. I like it at 90 degrees. In other words, it's halfway in the room. And for me, that's what I use it for. So um, I had to develop all this just by, you know, doing it and seeing what worked <laughs> and what sounded right in my room and so forth. But on top of that, it's what I feel is the most natural system because the idea is that you have a room and if the side speakers are too far back, then they become a surround speaker. I want something mm. right here. So given all of this, kind of the difference, you kind of even alluded to it, you know, controversy, people have different opinions and different thoughts. Yeah. Where do you, where do you find yourself in this? At the, so at the filming of this podcast, it wasn't too long ago that Apple would just announce their immersive audio with their earbuds and remixing and giving different benefits and options to artists for creating these immersive mixes in, in addition to their stereo mixes. Where do you... Where do you stand on the validity of immersive sound for just everyday, ordinary listening music? Uh, well, let's get right into it. Uh, I'm not a fan of it. I'm not a fan of an artificial ambience. Interesting. I do like it on computer speakers. Okay. Because they're small and and they don't have really a lot of uh, spatial information. So I like having the Apple and the, you know, and the other systems, the Dolby system and whatever it is. I like having that on a computer speaker, but that's it. If I'm listening to music, uh, with headphones, I don't like the effect because it's not real. It's mm. a psychoacoustic effect. I mean, it's better than the you know, the L7 back in the day by Lexicon, which they would artificially spread things in the car. And uh, it's better than some of the other systems, but it leaves me cold because there's uh, comb filtering. There's a lot of, uh, it doesn't, for me, recreate the ambience and the emotion of the original mix. It sounds interesting. On some things, it actually sounds really good. But on a lot of other things, it doesn't sound good at all. And so for me, you know, the one size fits all kind of thing doesn't really work. If you're working in the orchestral realm, um, the ambience creating, especially with, with additional verbs and stuff, can be very exciting. Mm. But if you're working in the pop field, you can't do that. You don't want to add verb ambience because that now changes the dynamic of the mix. Sure. And what you want to do is you've got to, you've got to treat that differently. Also, uh, some of these systems, uh, if you read like a lot of the papers, like the ITU papers and things like that, they refer to the rear speakers in a lot of these papers as ambient speakers, hmm. as well as the side speakers. 
which is why they do the 110 and the uh, the 180 or whatever happens to be. For music mixers, they're not ambient speakers. Hmm. They're equal partners to the front. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? Uh, we put instruments back there. We put guitars. We put vocals. We put all kinds of things. That's Therefore, it's important to me that you have a full range speaker similar to what you have in the front in the back because it's an equal speaker it belongs in a lot of 5-1 systems and 7-1 systems and even immersive dolby systems they have uh kind of theater speakers and side fills and then the rear the rear speakers are not full range they're not these big giant speakers they're what you would see in a theater many times and in fact my first visit to Do the Dolby Atmos room in New York City when I was first working on uh, Billy Joel and uh, and and uh, um, Atmos, I went and I listened to it in their room, and I was surprised to find that they had three big speakers in front, but then all the rest of them were side fills, including the rear speakers. Hmm. Um, and that's a theater system. That's not a music system. Yeah. So for me. Um, uh, I'm working with what I think is, is the most enjoyable. If someone listens to this on a theater system, it's hard for me to tell what they're going to experience because I'll put bass in the back. And if you don't have bass in the back, I don't know what you're going to do. Sure. Okay. So you're, you, you have a, a, a view where you're treating it as a mixer with the speakers with the, they all get the same level of respect. You, you haven't relegated any of them to, you're just happenstance so you you have right. a very purposeful so let me ask you as, as you look back so you you get the all of this we we'll go back now again the five one which it's funny when we talk about there was a time it was revolutionary the five one where it's like it hadn't yeah. been done but shortly after that you become sort of well not even a little before and after but you come involved with broadway and mixing movie for, for did those two career paths sort of converge the five one and broadway did they kind of happen as a result of one another or were they just no they just happened no. to yeah the broadway thing uh i've been trying uh i would love to do a for example an immersive mix of uh wicked which oh. we recorded in 19, oh. uh 2003 i think um and uh because i think uh or spam a lot or or um, a Book of Mormon. I'd love to do any one of those uh, in, in surround. But it's difficult with Broadway because uh, they don't sell a lot on in terms of product. And as far as the Broadway show goes, and as far as the immersive thing, we still don't really have an accepted physical format. Mm. You know, they're working on, there's all kinds of streaming things going on and they're working on increasing bandwidth and doing all that. But other than Blu-ray, uh, there's, there's no other physical format that can handle the information. So what, uh, some of these things are being done on Blu-ray. Um, the problem is, and, uh, I haven't checked this recently, but I went through a period a couple of years ago where I was so disappointed at Apple because they wouldn't play Blu-ray. Hmm. And, uh, you know, Apple uh, um, will play a CD, they'll play a DVD, but they won't play a Blu-ray. Hmm. Uh, you can't get a Blu-ray drive, or at least back then you couldn't. You might be able to do it now, uh, that you can write to uh with with apple so and as most of my stuff is all apple um because of pro tools um it kind of limits how you can you, you know how you can listen to this i'd love to be able to take a a blu-ray of something i do in here and bring it into the house for example and play it back but it's much more complicated than that so um, um at the moment uh, you know, there, we're still working on a lot of things. George Massenberg, for example, is, is working on, um, papers for formats and, and, or standardized formats and so forth. Um, hopefully we'll get something soon. Okay. All right. So let's, let's take two Did steps. I back. Your question? You I, look, it's exactly what I wanted. It was perfect. Okay. And, and again, 
it there's the thing we find like with most things in the music industry is there's no right or wrong. It's not an ethical dilemma. It's where right. everybody's in a different place. Everybody has different thoughts and opinions. Um, on both ends of the spectrum, we see the good, we see the, eh, the usual. and then there's always the skeptical, is this just the labels trying to take their old catalogs, reformat them for a new digital technology and sell me the no, same thing? No, we're trying to get them to do that. <laughs> and and they're, 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 they're resisting it. Yeah. By the way, have you tried this? What we got? It's, no, uh, is that the, Nitro. Yeah. No, is that, I have heard of it. Does it good? You fan? It's very good. It's very good. I, I, I'm a Coca-Cola fan. I never, you know, whenever they say, do you want a Pepsi? I kind of groan. But um, <laughs> uh, I love Coca-Cola. Been raised on it all my life. But this, I really do love. It's called uh, Pepsi Nitro. Anyway. You heard it here first, folks. Yeah. Pepsi Nitro. Right. So I... I you have worked with some artists through the majority of their career for a big part of their career. One of those artists in particular is Carly Simon. And I'm, I'm just curious as to how that, I mean, that's one of your earlier documented recording and, and credited relationships. And it's again, blossomed. My understanding is you've worked with her for the majority of her career as well as I, yours. We're working on an album now. So how, how did how does that start? Because again, uh, we all know in the industry relationships are everything, and clearly the two of you struck a, a, a wonderful chord musically. Can you walk us through a little bit about the origin of that relationship? Sure. I um, I mean, I was like most, especially men in this country. I was a huge fan of Carly Simon, and not just musically. Preach. Um, you know, so uh. But I loved her music. I loved the creativity in her chord structure. She wrote more like uh, George Gershwin than she did a pop star. It was a very, she has a very interesting tonal setup, uh, always goes to unexpected places. So I've always been a huge fan. Um, I was working on a Kiss album, Lick It Up. We're going to talk and, about that in a bit. Don't worry. Okay. <laughs> I was working on the kiss out. Well, then in that case, I'll just go right to it. Um, basically, I was working on at, with Kiss from 7 p.m. till 4 or 5 a.m. in the morning. Wow. Then uh, I was asked to do, so that was our setup. And I was asked, uh, I think Peter Asher or someone called and said, you know, Carly Simon is having a problem mixing her new album. It was called Hello, Big Man, I think. Um, in fact, she has a cut, Is This Love, you know, Bob Mar the Bob Marley track. Yep. Um, and uh, But no one can seem to get the right feel on it. And when I was recording James Taylor in um, Montserrat back in the year before, um, the island of Montserrat plays a lot of soca and a lot of reggae and so and those kinds of things, and that's their music in, mm. in the Caribbean islands. And the things that I were had been mixing, um, because uh, I did a lot of that, I did a lot of the reggae and and uh, uh, soca and all that uh, work back in the early '80s. And my music was all over the airwaves, and James and uh, Peter were, were very interested in that. So uh, when Carly uh, talked to Peter, Peter said, you should call Frank Filippetti because he mixes that stuff, uh, because this was a reggae tune. Mm. So we got together. Uh, like I said, I did Kiss from 7 to 4, and I came in uh, on a Tuesday to mix Carly from uh, a, a 10 a.m. to like 6 or something, wow. or 11 a.m. to 6. And I figured this is one song, you know, I'll do it, and then, you know, I'll be a little sleepy tonight, but so what? I was a kid back then. I could handle it. <laughs> um, so I mixed this song, and she loved it. And, and I loved her, of course, and she said, could you mix the rest of the album? And I said, well, I'm working with Kiss every night. So she said, well, how about, uh, you know, we, we do this. We do like 11 a.m. till 5, 
every day. Wow. Um, or we can even start 12 at, you know, if you want to go home at four or five, get like three or four hours sleep, come in at 11 and then we'll work till five. And then you'll have a break before you start kiss. So I did that for two weeks, mixing her album and working on lick it up at night. Wow. Mm. Yeah. Like I said, I could do that today. Just, just the one session and I need a nap. <laughs> so, so when you're now, well, this is a kind of an interesting segue. I, I mean, so I want to talk about the kiss record, but when you're engineering and you're mixing, so you're engineering the kiss record and right. you're mixing her record. Is there, um, uh, I talk about two things that are going to come to mind ear fatigue, obviously, because you're in front of speakers, obviously all day, both days, but what is your mindset, um, between that that's differentiating between being the engineer and not mixing and then the critical task of mixing how how did you make that work doing both i mean most people can't even really do one for three hours and you're doing both all day well uh, that's a the the premise of your argument isn't quite right all right i'm always mixing all right from from the downbeat of the recording session through the overdubs, I'm always mixing. I'm always trying to think of it as a mix, which is why uh, back in uh, early on in my career, I got in the habit of saving all my roughs and and writing down settings and all that. And because so many times while you're mixing in a session, you're in such a a headspace. And suddenly everything's clicking and you come up with these great roughs and people are always going, you know, uh, when they finish the album and then do the mix, they'll always come back to, you know, that rough you did, like when we first started on the guitar, that really captured it. This other one sounds great, but I don't know that it has the same emotional appeal and that's it. It's absolutely true. The, for me. From the day I start recording, it's all about the emotion. It's all about the emotional, uh, um, I guess, the emotional um, per performance of the artist along with the emotional performance of the musicians and trying to capture that, not just sonically, but emotionally. I think that's the most important thing. Uh, Early on in my career, I realized when I was a kid, I used to love listening to, at that time, AM radio in my car. And that sounds dreadful. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you compare that to a beautiful system, AM radio, not only was it mono at the time, but on top of that, it was what, 200 to 4K or something. Mm. So uh, with a tiny speaker and an automobile before they started putting in car system. And yet what's going on or, uh, Ray Charles or, or Frank Sinatra, those people come on and you got, you got the vibe. You were, you were tapping your foot, even though the Sonics were terrible. And that's, that's always been a thing for me. Like when MP3 came out, yeah, the Sonics are terrible, but so was AM radio, so were cassettes. The bottom line is the idea is to capture the emotion. If you got that, it doesn't matter what you listen to it on. So I'm always mixing. It's always trying to recreate something. Um, and for me, uh, when I when we when we used to do overdubs, especially vocals and things, I wouldn't feed the artists like Carly or James or whoever it was, I never fed them just, um, you know, uh, a board, a, you know, board mix to the headphones. I fed them my mix. So while she was singing, I was mixing and she could hear, uh, you know, if, if I needed to bring the strings up here, I would so that her vocal performance would be commensurate with the, with what was happening in the track. So when you work with someone repeatedly, like you have many of the artists you've worked with, are you consciously trying to help develop, for lack of a better term, a sound? Or are you just trying to get what you no. feel is the right sound for that context? I'm first, uh, first and foremost, I'm trying to get the performance. 
that's the most important thing to me, getting the performance right. I'm pretty comfortable with the tools that we have, not only in the 80s, 90s, and aughts, but today especially, to correct things later if I screw up. But I don't want to screw up the performance. Mm. You know, I don't, I want that to be the paramount thing. If I, you know, I would many times, as Carly would be singing, I'd be riding the vocal fader because, you know, I want her to feel as if this is a mix at, that she's singing to. So um, it's always about the performance. And uh, I can't tell you how many times, how many tracks I've done where the first take was the great take. But four takes later, I had gotten all the mics right and all the levels right. And, you know, but the, the, the take that maybe was the last take, I, I would always say, and I hate to say it, but I'd say, we should listen to the first take, <laughs> you know? And uh, we'd listen to, yeah, that's the one. Let's fix it, and then we'll, we'll move on. So as you're going through this artist or any artist, let's use Carly since that's who we're talking about. As you go to the next project, so you finish a record, record comes out, you go to the next record. Are you, is the last record in the rear view then we're trying to do something new or are you having conversations like, you know, this really worked well on the last record. Maybe we should do that again. No, I mean, I can't say that's never happened. I mean, sure. there have been times where something worked out. I don't think Every time I go in the studio, it's different. Um, I start, I may start out the same way, but once I start hearing things and once I try to capture the vibe that's trying to be created here, I, I will change microphones. I will change positions. I will, you know, um, I may start a vocalist off on a U47 or a uh, 269, but I may go to a 57 if that's the vibe that needs to be created. There's, for me, um, um, you know, there's no, you know, when I, when I first started working on drums, I used to use MS miking for the overheads. But then I started doing, you know, different things for different artists. You know, sometimes I'll just, the overheads are just cymbal mics, but 90% of the time, the overheads for me are the sound of the kit. Mm. And now the spot mics are just to add a little punch to it. But, um, you know, being a drummer, I used to sit at the kit and this is what I heard. And what I'm trying to do and what uh, I've worked a miking system where we can actually record from the the ears of the musician because mm. for me that's uh i did an experiment with uh, elliot shiner a few years ago uh where i recorded the whole orchestra every orchestra member had a had a mic here one or two mics here at their ears and then elliot set the system up um, um as the traditional recording and we did this thing at Berkeley, and uh, we A-B'd against the two, and it was quite frightening how great this sounded. Number one, because when you think about it, um, the people that develop these instruments, they don't develop them from what it sounds like out there. Hmm. They can't hear it out there. They've never hmm. heard it out there. You know, them playing it out there. So what they hear is what when they're playing the guitar and suddenly this is what comes to them, not what it sounds like three feet or two feet in front. So I'm working heavily on trying to get that perfected and do an album or more, a couple albums, maybe doing it that way. Um, but there's some log logistical issues, but, uh, um, we've got it almost all sorted out now. So, but like I said, that's it. I'm always experimenting. Uh, I I don't have a set way of doing anything. So with that in mind, I want to go back to the Kiss record really quickly as a lifelong Kiss fan uh, and you engineering the Lick It Up album. Um, at that point in time in their career, obviously incredibly successful, dominated the world in the 70s. Does an act like that, and, you, now, and that's not to say this is the only act, but you've worked with a lot of acts and the hate, like at the height of what the music industry used to be. Um, mm -hmm. Right. Is, is there a... The producer comes in and says to you, you're engineering, were there a lot of strict rules or expectations 
because of where the band had come from and what they were trying to do? Was that a situation where it's like, well, this is what KISS in air quotes sounds like, so we have to do this? Or were you given the opportunity to really try and, again, do your thing as an engineer? Well, interesting, that because uh, there are two stories that are related to that with KISS. First of all, to start with, I was working on, uh, I was finishing up a project uh, on a Friday, and uh, I had the weekend off, um, and I got a call uh, uh, from, I guess, from the studio manager at the studio, and he said, I got a call today from KISS. And they've been at Hit Factory, and they don't like what they're getting. They can't get a drum sound. They've been working there. Uh, well, they worked there for two weeks. They worked someone else for a week, and they haven't been able to get a drum sound. So he said, uh, I told them that they could have Sunday, because Sunday's open at your st in your room. My room is Studio B. And could you just get them started on a drum sound, and then, you know, we'll have a... Um, We'll have someone else take take it over, you know. Once you're once it's all set up, and I says, okay, uh, you know, didn't didn't like leaving my Sunday, but I came in, came in at ten a.m. Uh, by ten p.m. that night, we had all eleven tracks done with drums. They loved the sound. They loved what was being done. I enjoyed being there. And, uh, after the session, they came up to me and they said, um, you know, uh, we'd like you to, we'd like you to finish the rest of the album. So, and again, I get this, my timing screwed up, but, uh, this, I may have already started working on Carly. I can't remember, but I was, uh, I guess maybe, um, uh, Anyway, uh, right. I think that was it. I had started working with Carly first and we were, we were mixing from 10 to till five or six every day. And then, so on that Sunday, Kiss came in and I said, look, I'm working with Carly Simon every day. And they said, what time do you finish? And I say, I finished it around six o'clock. They say, okay, we'll come in from seven till four. And even if it's just you get us started for a couple of hours and then we'll have an assistant, you know, take over from there. Um, I, I said, all right, I'll do it. So I started, uh, I started working with them at Car Carly in the day, kiss at night. And um, what was interesting about it was not only the transition between the two different types of material, but also their work ethic is very unlike many of the other rock bands that I've worked with. They're there to work. They're it's it's we're doing it. You know, you know, nobody people don't show up, you know, three hours late. They're not doing drugs. They're not they're really focused on what they're doing. And it was a very enjoyable session. And mm -hmm. I learned one of the most important lessons that I've taken with me over the years in that session. And that what came from Paul Stanley, because you know they hired me because in in one day I had gotten drums for all ten songs. Each song started with the drums, then we went added other stuff. When we started doing guitars, we started with Paul, and I start uh, and uh, I went out. I mic'd up the amp. I can't remember what amp he was using at the time, um, but anyway, I mic'd it up the way I would normally mic it. And I was pretty happy with the sound when I came in the control room and I sat down and listened to it. And I says, okay, Paul, what do you think? It sounds really good. I said, but it's not me. And I mm. said, what do you mean? I, he says, that's not my sound. And I said, what is your, he says, come on with me. We went out. And he made me listen to the guitar at the amp. And he said, that's my sound. I had this nice big guitar sound, but that wasn't what, what he sounded like. The sound he worked on to get on his amp, it's not, you can't just reproduce a really good sound on that. You've got to get the artist's 
sound, his mm. emotional impact. Otherwise, it's it's not the same. And when I came back in, I I I moved some mics around. I think I even changed some mics. Uh, came in. Uh, I may have had some EQ. I took that off it. I just did a really kind of focused uh, Paul Stanley sound, and he loved it. And I realized at that point that that goes not just for the guitar, but anything. Nobody listens, uh, or most people don't listen to an instrument the way the musician hears it. That's that's part of that recording thing that I come up that I've come up with. But beyond that, the musician has a sound, their own particular sound, and. I was, uh, I think Paul mentioned to me at one point uh, before we, we finalized something. He said, I said, I think that sounds great. He says, it does, but you're listening to it as a drummer. Mm. Listen to it as a guitar player. And that was the, that was the essence of that. Listening, listening as a drummer and listening as a guitar player are two totally different experiences. Once I started to get that headspace, I realized that listening to a vocalist, listening to a violin player, listening to a sax player, Michael Brecker, whoever it happens to be, you have to listen from their point of view, as if, as if you were that instrumentalist. And once I got that, like I said, it kind of threw out the window standard setups because you know you can use a standard setup for an orchestra but there you're you're recording an ensemble but when you're in co recording individual elements you want to make sure those elements are emotionally correct mm. wow so and, and that brings up a, another great i think not challenge but uh, observation during that time the same time you recorded kiss uh, you were engineering you were doing a lot of rock music you were actually there were a number of rock bands in the, in the early and mid eighties that you worked with because it was a very popular, you know, you worked with Foreigner, yeah. you've worked with Survivor. Do any of those bands, you talk about how Kiss was a little bit different than some of the acts. Do any of those bands have anything in common uh, that you noticed that would con maybe contribute to why they were so popular or wildly accessible at the time you were working with them? Start with, they had great writers. I mean, you don't get better than Mick Jones and Lou mm -hmm. Graham as as writer of of pop songs. I mean, my God, the 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 hooks and so forth they came up with, and and the arrangements were pretty spectacular. Um, Kiss, they knew their audience, they knew exactly what they what they were going for, and whereas Foreigner, it was uh, each record they wanted actually different than the last record. Um, with Kiss, it was more about, let's just, let's establish a vibe and go for it. And and they knew their audience, they knew their sound, and they went ahead with it um, in a very practical, but, you know, but uh, still, um, um, you know, well done way, but they were, they, they were making this for their audience. Warner, Mick was making it for some higher, you know, uh, authority. Sure. He was, uh, uh, and, and so, but all of those bands, Frankie Sullivan, uh, and, in uh, survivor, same thing, you know, uh, survivor was great because again, a lot of the rock bands, uh, and they will remain nameless, but, you know, did spend a lot of time at the drug counter. Sure. But these, you know, folks like, uh, kiss and foreigner and, and, uh, they, they were, they knew what they wanted and they knew what they had to do. And very seldom did they, uh, you know, they would question things, but when they heard it, they heard it. Hmm. Well, speaking of foreigner, when you heard it for the first time. And also <laughs> just, just to say, I got to tell you, you don't get a better singer than Lou Grant. I mean, no. for rock and roll. I mean, come on. So that, and it's, and you know, all of those bands had great singers. Um, uh, you know, and, and the, the, uh, that's, I, I think one of the, one of the lessons that Phil Ramone taught me was it's at the end of the day, it's always about the singer because mm. 
you know, that uh, uh, Frank uh, Frank Sinatra once said something to Phil Ramone like um, uh, they were in a record store and uh, a record of Frank's came on that, that Phil had produced. And um, uh, Phil says, boy, that sounds great. He says, yeah, I'm sure the first trombonist mother is going to love it. <laughs> but in other words, the concept being that yeah. yeah, he wasn't happy with that because, you know, I mean, it's centered on the voice. And, yeah. you know, yeah. as great as you get the band to sound, if the singer isn't taking control, you're not going to get the emotional experience of the listener. Well, and you, I was alluding to, so you were there, you worked on Agent Provocateur, you worked on the big Foreigner record. So when you heard the the song, I Want to Know What Love Is, the song that puts Foreigner in another sky, did you know at the time? Did everybody know at the time? They did. So you, everyone knew. The first time we heard it, I mean, we knew. I mean, we heard it just with the band and, you know, no choir or nothing. But, I mean, as a... I want to know what love is, you know, I mean, come on. Yeah. It's just, it's just, uh, an emotional monumental, uh, song. And just like, uh, you know, there are other songs that people didn't get it right away. I didn't, I wasn't engineering at the time, uh, but when Carly recorded, you're so vain, Man. they didn't think they went through a lot of versions of it. They couldn't figure out what to do with it. And she said, I never thought it was going to be anything. And, uh, but now when I listen to it, I say, how could you have missed that back then? Because, you know, I just did a five, uh, an immersive of, of a no secrets album. And how do you miss that? But, you know, at the time, you know, they hadn't really locked in on, but with, I want to know what love is, it wasn't ever, it wasn't, you know, and, and we worked on it as if it was the hit. That was going to be my next question. So when you hear something and you everyone kind of acknowledges it, does that change the way you approach working on it from your standpoint? I wasn't a producer on the album. I was the engineer. Right. So uh, it didn't affect me, but it did affect um, uh, Mick. It did affect Alex Adkin, who was the co-producer with Mick on the record. So... They looked at it as this is a hit, and one, I don't want to fuck it up, and two, um, I want to make sure we have left no stone unturned. Mm -hmm. So when it's when you're immediate, you know, and and the record company would come in every now and again and listen, and they knew. So it was always about we know this is a hit, and and it was more about the producer and the writers. Uh, you know, taking extra care with it than me, because, you know, I, I, I put the same care into everything I do, whether it's a hit or it's not. Well, and at that point in time, one of the things that's, it's not certainly not new by any stretch of the imagination, but was more frequent was the use of synthesizers and uh, digital keyboards in the studio. So as an engineer, were there any was that a learning experience? Because again, you were there before it happened and as it started becoming more and more popular and as you were getting more used to it, were there any tricks of the trade that you can share to make the keyboards work in that sort of still that analog rock context? Yeah, well, there are two things I can refer to. One is uh, on, um, uh, let's see, on the Foreigner album, um, there was a song called uh, Yesterday. That was yesterday. Mm -hmm. Boom, boom, boom. Well, that boom, 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 boom was a um, acoustic guitar. But Mick wanted it to be the biggest acoustic guitar you've ever heard. So he brought in a keyboard player named uh, Wally Batteru, an incredible keyboard player from the Caribbean. And... Uh, Mick had just gotten a synclavier system. Wow. And so Wally knew how to run the synclavier system. And I recorded a sample of the acoustic guitar. Boom, doom, 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 doom. He took that and he put it into the synclavier. Literally, eight, 10, 12, maybe two days later, 
he had finished the programming. I mean, this wasn't a day where you just call up a sound on right. the Sinclair. You had to sit there and program the shit out of it. And it was a mono device at that time. You couldn't play a chord Jeez. on it. So, but he did some kind of magic in the Sinclair. But I was literally sitting in the chair most of the day while he's typing away and playing things and stuff like this. So, um, so you know, getting those sounds sometimes was uh, was pretty difficult. Um, the other thing, uh, but you know, by the time that uh, certainly by the mid '80s and so forth, polyphonic keyboards and stuff had come out, and things were a lot easier to program. <coughs> Excuse me. Hold on. Oh, that's okay. But, um, and and Mick had a polyphonic keyboard too. The uh, uh, Prophet, no, he had a Prophet Five and uh, a Jupiter Eight. Okay, those were the two keyboards for most of the stuff on the album, and uh, so there were polyphonic keyboard. But I mean, the sampler come uh sequencer that was a new thing but uh the the second story is that i was <clears throat> a couple of years later i was producing a band called the lost boys from <clears throat> from uh, the uk and i remember one day i had hired a keyboard player robbie kilgore to come in and put some keyboards on one of the tracks so to get the keyboard parts, what we did was he'd play and then uh, and we'd do an overdub and then I'd say, okay, uh, maybe add a little this or that. He'd do that. And then I'd say, okay, maybe a little pad or something. And then we'd record that. We, we did about six keyboard parts. Then he said, okay, uh, you know, and I had it. Uh, I played it back. We loved it. He says, okay, now uh, let me work a little bit and because you know those were all played in real time. He says, "Let me let me uh, uh, quantize it a bit and get it get it going." So I said, "Okay." So about an hour later, he has the whole thing quantized, all six parts. And so uh, I start playing the track, and um, you know we couldn't undo things back then. Mm. So I play I I put it on input because I loved what he had. So I'm not going to re record anything yet. So the sequencer plays, and I said, what, what happened? He says, what do you mean? Are you sure all the parts are there? He says, let me check. And he went through each one. All the parts were playing. When he played it live, the lines that he would play, like down, da, down, da, down. I'm using Foreigner, but I can't remember the line. Of um he may have played that four or five times with four or five different synthesizers. Well, when they were played live, it was huge. When they were sequenced and quantized, the sound just got tiny mm. because you don't have all those different, you know, different attacks and, and so forth that happen when you quantize something. Mm. Um, it's like, you know, back in the day when you put two guitars uh, two rock and roll guitars left and right and played them, they were really big and open, or two acoustic guitars. But in the 80s, people started having the ability, especially when the uh, Sony 3348, to move things a little bit and make them more in time or to, to duplicate something. And that's when things started getting smaller. Mm. So... If you have this live thing going on, it's fantastic. But sometimes you can have it too precise, too together, and then it loses the emotion and the space. So when you're capturing those keyboard performances as an engineer, are you basically just taking the line level out of the keyboard into the desk, or are you doing any processing on your end? And or More... more most times, in fact, maybe 90% of the time, I'm just taking the keyboard out to the desk and letting him or, or her uh, put the, you know, get the sound that they want. You know, we'll, we'll talk about it and mold it, but the bottom line is it's just what they're sending me. Uh, when I've worked with someone like Michael Beinhorn on the Korn album, 
the first mm. corn album we did together. Yeah. Um, he would actually, we'd record it and then he'd put it through synthesizers and, and he'd had a, a, a bank of synthesizers and he would, we would put that sound through that and then he'd manipulate it some more. So, you know, but most of the time I'm just recording with the, with the keyboard players playing. Are you ever, uh, as an engineer or even as a producer, are you ever surprised by a call or request you get from an artist? Like you'd think to yourself, I, I never would think that person would reach out. But, you know, I, you talk about corn, and obviously metal and Frank Filippetti are probably the first two names people put together. Was it, uh, is that a surprise to you or was it, is it just another, another day at the office? No, it was a surprise and yet not. Um, <laughs> I had done, I had, you know, I mean, I worked with Kiss and people like that pre metal. Of course. Yeah. But um, I had, uh, I got a call to do, um, oh, what's her name? Uh, hold on. Courtney Love. Okay. Courtney Love and, and her band, uh, Hole. Hole, right. Yeah. I got a call from uh, Michael Beinhorn. Um, he was working with Courtney Love and Hole, and similar to the Kiss thing where they couldn't get a drum sound, he was having a hard time getting her vocal sound. So he called me up one night to uh, to do a to try to get a vocal on a song. So uh, I came in, we did the vocal, and then I ended up doing all her vocals for the 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 Hole album. Wow. Um. But, you know, a vocal's a vocal. A good sound's a good sound. You know, if you know what a voice is supposed to sound like and you think like like I said you should think, which is pretend you're the singer listening to yourself mm. and trying to get what they're hearing. So we got it, and it was great. Um, and so I'd work with Michael. I loved working with him. We enjoyed each other. So I wasn't surprised to get another call from him. Uh, what it was though, was, uh, he called me, um, to do, uh, very dark, uh, <laughs> that's so anyway. many people, Frank. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Nowadays. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. man, uh, not Manson, uh, Manson. No. Um, anyway, I can't remember. Um, and he, uh, but I couldn't do it. Uh, but um, I was kind of interested that he would call me Marilyn Manson. Okay. Uh, yeah. I was, so, but I couldn't do it because I was working on another project. But when that, when he finished that project, he called me again, said, look, uh, I know you couldn't do Marilyn Manson, but I'm going to work on a corn album next. Would you be interested? I say, you bet. I'd love to. That was it. You know, wow. I went down there and uh, went to uh, L.A. and uh, we spent nine months on that record. Um, wow! And uh, but it was a joy. You know, again, one of those artists like uh, um, Jonathan Davis is just beyond talented, and uh, um, he's got an incredible sensibility, uh, and he's nothing like the person that gets portrayed on stage you sure. know he uh, he's a terrific guy and uh but just in incredibly talented has a lot of <clears throat> angst in him much of us uh coming from the days he worked as a medical examiner and uh and i guess it was uh uh in california there um saw a lot of you know babies that had been killed and stuff and and just kind of really affected him. So he has some anger and angst about that, but you know, he gets it out in his music and a, in a really productive and very, um, musical way. When you're working with an artist like that, um, who is predominantly using very high gain, you know, big frequency spectrum guitar sounds, are you trying to have them capture all of that sound at once, or are you doing a lot of stacking and layering to, to get sort of the thickness and the, the breadth of that sound? Both. Um, uh, first of all, you had, you know, you have head and monkey, you had the two guitar players. Sometimes they double apart. Sometimes they do totally different parts. Mm. Uh, 
Um, if they are doing totally different parts, maybe we'll double one uh, or we'll we'll not. You know, so it 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 goes both ways. Um, but I will say that's probably the hardest album I've ever mixed, and not just hard in terms of this, but hard in terms of difficulty, mm. because you have, as you said, these uh, um, you know these triamp. Uh, sounds that um, that go from you know, and they have the detuned guitars, yep. and so you know, so you got frequencies not just in Fieldy's bass going all the way down in in the first fundamental, but their guitars, and then going all the way up to you know uh, four, five, six k, and what have you. Each guitar occupies such a huge amount of space mm. that getting their guitars. Uh, and Fieldy, who was incredible in developing a sound that kind of wrapped around those guitars, very low and very high with not a lot of middle, letting the guitars occupy that space. It's really orchestral the way they put it together. Mm. And his that concept really worked beautifully on on, you know, working with those guys on that record. But for me, as a mixer, Trying to get all that into two speakers is not an easy job. Especially when there's drums and then Jonathan's unique voice and synths and sound effects. It's, uh, yeah. and it's, it's very cool to hear you say that there was a challenge. I think a lot of people look at someone like Frank Filippetti and think, well, you can throw anything at him. He's, there's no more challenges anymore. But it's, well, it's, no, that's not true. It's always there, you know, very seldom uh, do I work on any project where I don't learn something. Mm. somewhere along the way, I learned something that I didn't know before. And, and just to clarify, I uh, ended up not mixing the first Korn album, although I mixed a, a couple of subsequent ones, but, you know, even while, uh, um, trying to put these things together and listening back and then later mixing a couple more albums, just making all that work is just w was incredibly difficult. And I hand it to, all those folks that are, you know, that are really good at doing that, like Andy, who did the, uh, the, the, uh, untouchables album. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's a real talent to mix that stuff. A lot of people would just say, oh, it's just, you know, noise. No, it takes, it takes some years to do it. So I, I would, I'm curious, you talk about things you've learned while, while you're working on every record. Let's go a little, a little further back. You did some work. You've worked with Frank Zappa when, when Frank was alive. And no, I didn't when he was alive. No. So it was, it was post humor. Okay. So post, yeah. when you're in that situation, um, and you're working with someone again, we talk, it's very similar to kiss where it's like, there's this entire lineage of music and expectation and, my first question is, were you a fan at all of Frank Zappa before you worked on the material? I was a fan in the sense that I knew how brilliant he was. I wasn't necessarily a fan in the sense that a lot of Zappa fans know every, yeah, everything about That's a different level of fandom. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a different level. It's what, insane. So the first thing you have to deal with is there are those fans who are going to call you on anything. Yeah. Secondly, though, as I started working on his songs, I just realized as much of a fan I was before, I just, I, I think he's, for me, uh, he's one of the best talents that we had in, in, in the rock jazz genre. I mean, his, and and class he he had the ability to do things I'm not sure any other musician I've worked with could do. Um, I wished I'd have been able to work with him when when uh, he was alive, but I got I was contacted by Gail Zappa, who was in in charge of his catalog, and started doing mixes on stuff. But I have to tell you, um, his writing. You know, he doesn't get the credit he deserves because of the scatological nature of some of, of the songs and so yeah. forth. So people kind of dismiss it. But boy, when you get in there listening to the writing and not only that, the playing and the bands that he had, you know, um, otherworldly, uh, yeah, George Duke and, and, and uh, 
uh, Ruth, and, and uh, I mean, just these people were unbelievable. So as you're bringing these mixes up, and and the the <laughs> the the artist isn't there. They're uh, they're not here to bounce things off to approve. Do you feel a different kind of pressure? Is there a different? Yeah. It's sort of a different. Okay, who who has the final say in that scenario? Who who are we? I mean, obviously, if the artist isn't there to be pleased, who are we pleasing at that point in time? Well, in this case, it was Gail and Joe. Uh, Joe is like the unofficial um, torch carrier in terms of the musical and production side of Frank's stuff. Um, and uh, But uh, uh, Gail was, at the end of the day, the final say. Mm. But for me, um, once again, I felt I didn't have Frank sitting next to me. So I felt real pressure to try to understand what Frank would have wanted by listening to his material, classical, jazz, pop, uh, rock, whatever, immersing myself in it, trying to get inside his head, and then... Hopefully, when I'm moving a guitar fader, uh, I hear, you know, Frank wouldn't have wanted that. Or, yes, he would have wanted it louder. I, you know, but it's hit or miss, you know, sure. you do the best that you can. But uh, probably one of, one of the top five experiences I've ever had wow. was being asked to record uh, Frank's uh, 2000 Motel Suite. Uh, 200, <laughs> boy, 200. am I inflating. Yeah. That's all um, right. Yeah, you know, uh, 200 motel suite um, with the uh, L.A. Symphony Orchestra wow. at uh, Disney Hall. It's, it's a highlight in my life and in my career uh, to be there at Disney Hall, number one, recording the L.A. Symphony Orchestra, number two. Esa Pekka Salonen is the conductor, number three. It's the 10th anniversary of Disney Hall, mm. and we've got not only the orchestra, an expanded orchestra, because Frank wrote for double woodwind section, double horn section, three pianos, three uh, classical guitars, um, nine percussion section, all of this on the stage, in addition to 12 principals and a 60 voice choir. So that was a humongous undertaking. Yes. But one of my, like I said, one of my favorite moments of all time, um, mixing it was a complete joy. And uh, um, that is something that before I leave this planet, I would love now to be able to go back to and mix an immersive because. Mm. I think it's a masterwork. I think uh, the uh, the the way Esso Pekka Salona put together the suites and with Gale and put all this stuff together was frighteningly beautiful, uh, powerful, and uh, just unbelievable. And uh, to be able to say, when I look back over my career, yeah, I recorded ranks 200 motels at Disney Hall. That's that's all right. It's pretty spectacular. I'm not going to lie. I mean, like you said, out of all the... And, and that's high praise coming from a man with a discography like yours. So, I mean... I, I don't think that that's a surprise to most folks that are familiar with Frank's work or enjoyed any of Zappa's music that uh, it would be that enjoyable for someone to work on, which is it, kind of... I, I'm curious, as a mix engineer... It, do you get the same joy uh, or the same uh, camaraderie with the music if you're mixing something you haven't recorded? Or is, well, do you approach it differently? It's music. Great okay. music. Great music. You know, I mean, whether uh, I've listened, uh, there are times when I finish a mix of something I haven't recorded or something I have, and uh, I'll listen to it two or three more times, not listening to it as a mixer, just listening to it because I love the song. I love I love the form and I love the emotion that it leaves me with. So no, I'm uh, it's uh, you know mixing is like working on a puzzle. You know uh, you know it's just 
trying to fit all the pieces in the right way and and coming up with a plan. And so if you have a, a puzzler's mind or a scientific mind, leaving aside the emotional aspect of it, it's just when you figure out the puzzle, you get that rush, you know, mm. like suddenly you figured out how all this stuff sounds and works together to create the emotion you've been looking for. And then it becomes a joy. Wow. Well, so, okay. We've talked about uh, quite a number of, of artists and scenarios. There's, there's one more type of record you've, you've worked on a number of these soundtracks, motion picture soundtracks. And um, one in particular streets of fire you're associated with from, from the eighties, the Walter Hill, uh, yeah. the eternal fanboy sequel to the warriors. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. Um, but What's so that's uh, again for the time that movie was released and the type of music that was on it's very modern, very pop, RB infused drum Jim machines. Steinman. Jim yeah. Stein, it was um, a very, very epic for lack of a better term kind of soundtrack. What was that process like for you? Was it were, working for motion picture versus Broadway differences there for you, or end result is the huge. same? Huge, huge, okay, huge. No, Broadway more often than not, I'm the producer and the engineer. So it's my decision how the record turns out. Sure. Uh, movies, you have no, you have no, uh, no control. You can mix a piece. Uh, I, I spent, uh, uh, Carly Simon and I on, um, postcards from the edge, uh, working with Mike Nichols. Uh, we worked for weeks on the opening title track. Have you seen me lately? It was supposed to go over this montage as the, as the, uh, it was a one shot, uh, that went on for a couple of minutes and it, it was brilliant what Carly did. And yet when it came time to mix a movie, they dropped the song. Oosh. So, so, you know, so I, had, I mean, you literally have no control over what you deliver them, what you want, but the, the director at the end of the day, it's his movie, and he decided he didn't want music to start. So mm. that's what happened. Um, so that's one of the differences. But the other difference is that you're with uh, on a soundtrack album, you're trying to you know, recreate something for maybe people that have seen the play or haven't seen the play, but give them that, that audience vibe. But more often than not in film, except for the opening and the end title, very often all the stuff you do in between is very softly underneath the, you know, and depending on the scene that may be, uh, um, it may be intrusive. It may not be. So the levels are brought down or you need something powerful, but it can't be so powerful that it overtakes, uh, the dialogue and the sound effects, uh, sound effects is, you know, I mean, drives me crazy. Sometimes my music <laughs> is in the movie is minus 10 and the sound effects is plus 30, you know, but that's, uh, I have to write something down actually, cause it reminded me of something. Anyway, uh, so under those circumstances, um, you know, you're dealing with an entirely, you're dealing with a couple of songs, but most of it is to enhance the action. It's not to call attention to itself. On mm -hmm. the other hand, a Broadway show, it's very important to get the lyrics and the story and all that right out in front of the listener. Wow. So it's Streets of Fire and working in in sort of that capacity. Um, you've got different artists contributing different things. Is that ever a challenge? Again, yeah. I it, you've got you know this artist wants it this way that art, and to your point, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter because the director is going to have the final say on what happens. I I mixed a song for Arthur Baker called um, "Don't Play Sun City" or "I Don't Want to Play Sun City." It's called Sun City, I think. Didn't little Steven, and we had yeah, a bunch of people we, on that little Steven. Yeah, we had it was a twelve inch, and we had like a hundred artists. I mean, you know, Bruce Springsteen, some new love, all these artists coming. So I'm there mixing, and I'm being visited all day for two days by every manager of every artist 
Mm. They want to hear their section where their singer is singing, and each one of them wants their singer louder than the other singer. So <clears throat> I had to deal with that that scenario, but you know, you deal with it. Uh, but uh, you know, on Streets of Fire, dealing with different artists isn't nearly as difficult because usually they're artists in their individual, you know, songs or whatever it is. Um, Jim Steinman was the producer of the music and, uh, a, another, another brilliant writer, you know, up there with Frank and Carly and just Jim is again, another underrated artist, Jimmy Webb, all these people that have written these unbelievable songs, but nowadays, you know, they, they're almost forgotten. Mm -hmm. But the simple fact is Jim, uh, died a couple of years ago and it was saddest thing for me because not only was he probably one of the great people of the world, but, um, he was brilliant and his songs are brilliant. You, you know, when you go through something like think of paradise by the dashboard light, oh, well, so you may not clips of the heart. I mean, just so totally clip. You may not think of it now because he's influenced so many other people. But when that stuff came out, it was, you know, it was the new version of the wall of sound and the new, you know, just this, uh, everything was on 11, you know, it yeah. was, and, and, uh, but he was brilliant. And, and that was my first chance to work with Jim Steinman was on, was on that film streets of fire. And, uh, um, uh, he was just, uh, uh, he heard things that I couldn't hear. He, he was just, he could, he could, first of all, he could hear frequencies. He could hear like a bat. Uh, but, mm. uh, he just, you know, oh, you know what? Uh, we need to double this part. Well, by the time we were finished, we maybe did, we did a whole 24 track stack of just vocal overdubs <laughs> and he had, uh, uh, Rory Dodd and Eric Troya were the, uh, uh, were two of the singers and, and, uh, what, what was the woman's name? I've forgotten now. I didn't work with her as much, but anyway, the two guys would come in and they would sing all the parts that Jim had written and then they do it again and then they do it again and then they do it again. We do that 24 times on the 24 track. So we had those two guys singing, you know. Uh, on Jeez. all 24 and poor air, uh, I, I think it was air. No, it was, um, oh, Rory, right. Eric and Rory died. Um, Rory more often than not was given the high parts. Mm. And I mean the high parts so high that another couple of steps and only dogs could hear it. I mean, he had, you know, and his voice would be ragged by the end of the night. I mean, you know, Kind of on bright eyes, you know, that that's Eric. <laughs> yeah. No, that's not her. Wow. That's, that's, you know, and, um, and he, it, you know, and all these, uh, uh, great choral parts that Jim would write and Rory and Eric, uh, did most of them. Wow. Wow. So do as, as the engineer, as someone capturing all this stuff and, and you're constantly, recapturing the same performance, right? So it's the same singer going back, just doing it again. Do you ever have any, and, and I've never really thought about it now, but technical concerns or issues with the mics, the mic giving out, is it changing? Is it moving? I mean, is it when you're overdubbing, are you trying to keep things as consistent as possible or is a little variation okay when it comes to that kind of a thing? Well, like my story about the synthesizer, you know, uh, a little variation widens it, hmm. you know, uh, Brian Wilson, I think this is attributed to him, but I'm not sure, but I believe he said, um, uh, the, uh, guitar tuner ruined the music <laughs> and, and, or something to that effect, you know, music lost an edge when the guitar tuner, and it's true because when you listen to a lot of those early seventies and stuff, acoustic guitars, two guitars and it's big and wide as his house. But then once the guitar tuner came in, you know, now when you double it, it's the same thing. It's not, it's, it doesn't have that width anymore, but when they used to tune it by ear and then on the second track tuned it, uh, you know, by ear again, it was a different tuning and suddenly it got wide instead of tiny. Mm. So 
my uh, one of my mantras. Uh, I have a couple of mantras. One is fuck fear. That's the first <laughs> one. The second one is uh, you know uh, art is messy. Mm. Great art is messy. It can't be too precise because the more precise you get, the more computerized it is. Mm. So uh, I don't like tuning everything, uh, fixing everything. I like to keep it a little messy. So, okay, you've done, you, you've had this whole experience of recording everything. Let's just say everything. Is there anything in particular that you record that you like the most? Any type of instrument? Is it singing? Is it drums? Is it vocal? What do you, at this point in time in your career, what do you still enjoy really recording the most as an engineer? I think because I was a drummer, it's only naturally that I love recording drums. I jump at any chance to record drums. It's my favorite thing to do. Um, because to me, it's like a mini orchestra. You know, it's not, it's not just the fact that there's, you know, the, the various drums, but they all fit together like the string section and the woodwind section and the brass section. They, each one is an instrument in its own right. So I love that and putting it together and making it sound big or small or whatever it happens to be. So that's certainly true. Um, I don't know that there's any type of music that I prefer over any other hmm. i love i love after finishing a rock section uh or session to go to a classical section um i love uh doing carly simon and then going to kiss you know i love the ability i love uh doing live you know uh uh i've done you know the not only the frank zappa 200 motels but bocelli in central park that hmm. was a nightmare um sure. and you know and uh, but i love doing those i love being able at broadway shows i love all of it because i love a great broadway show i had you know so much fun working with uh, uh matt and trey on um um the book of mormon the book of mormon you know that it was phenomenal i mean i remember going because i was uh hired to work on it i remember going I got to go to a preview so I would know, uh, you know, what to expect. And then I could set up my recording, uh, appropriately. So I go to the preview and, um, I didn't know anything about it other than Matt and Trey were involved. Mm. But at that time, when that came out, all the press about Broadway was about Spider-Man. About Spider Man, you know, somebody died. Spider Man, they're not they're not going to finish the theater in time. Spider Man, they're having trouble with all the mechanicals. Spider Man, you know, is Julie going to be in? I, you know, just yeah. it was it was a nightmare, and there was nothing about this musical, you know, that Trey and Matt had done. So I go to the preview not knowing anything other than it's Trey and Matt. So I go there with my wife, and. After about the first 10 minutes or so, we're kind of looking at each other like, this isn't right. You know, <laughs> I don't know that I can do this. Then there's a point about 15 or 20 minutes in where suddenly it's like, oh, that was pretty funny. Um, by the end of the show, you're laughing like, you know, it's like unbelievable. But, but like, you know, you know, that scene and, um, um, the producers, springtime for Hitler, yep. where suddenly they pan up <laughs> the audience and they're yeah. all, well, that was like the first 10 or 15 minutes of, you know, but then again, because I hadn't heard anything about it. I didn't know what this was going to be about. Sure. And so, uh, but boy, another, I got to say when, when, when I tell these stories, I think back, I'm the luckiest guy in the planet to work with these people. You well, know, it's did you just, see this though? I mean, you're starting your career like late sixties, early seventies. This is what you're going to do, or at least this is what you think you're going to do. Could you have ever anticipated this no. is where you'd be? No. I mean, I was a singer songwriter. I mean, I was a drummer, but, but, uh, I made my living. I was a songwriter for screen gems, cold gems music. And, uh, I started looking into engineering when they, 
uh, it was a, you know, a five-year contract with four one-year options. And I think the third or fourth year, they decided not to pick up my option. So suddenly I had no income. Mm. And so, uh, but I loved being in the studio. So I'd gotten to know a studio owner, uh, Simon Andrews, who had a place on 24th Street called Roy Track. And I got to know him. And uh, we used to have, you know, discussions about sound. And then uh, I called him up and I said, I don't have a job. Can I work over there? And he said, well, I guess. I said, but look, I'm 30 years old. It's too late for me to be an assistant for five years. Can I just try to start engineering? He says, well, I can only pay as an assistant. I said, I don't care. I just want to start engineering. So I worked there for about a month and got my first engineering gig. Uh, did great. Second engineering gig. Almost destroyed uh, 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 a relationship with a client. Um <laughs> And, uh, but then after that, six months later, I was chief engineer at the studio. And so I always thought I was going to be a singer songwriter. Mm. I didn't think I was going to be an engineer. I literally turned to engineering because the singer songwriter thing was done as far as I could see. And you don't live in New York with no job. So, mm. um, I, I got this job and the more I did it, the more I loved it. And, uh, after, like I say, after six months, I was doing all kinds of good stuff. Then we built the, the facility on 48th street. And that's where I met Peter Asher, um, doing pirates of Penzance. And he pretty much, uh, you know, he pretty much made my career something that was going to take a, a, a long while, you know, a long while to get started. But I worked with him in my first year. Um, he got me the gig with foreigner. Uh, mm -hmm. he got me the gig with James Taylor that got me the gig with Carly Simon, you know, so it was just his involvement. Uh, so, but what used what I used to laugh about was I used to, for, for the five years or four years, I was a singer songwriter at screen gems. I died to try to get a song to Peter Asher. And then like, Two years after engineering, I'm working with them next to me. So, you know, but I didn't think that was my calling yet. But I have to say, by the time of Foreigner, uh, I figured I never looked back. I, I stopped all playing the guitar and writing and doing. I just stopped it dead. And I just loved this so much, so much more than, than even the songwriting. Wow. Well, I think it shows. I mean, again, I don't think you could have the body of work that you have if you didn't love it. You, it, you just couldn't. Because again, yeah. just listening to some of the challenges and opportunities, no matter how great the opportunity, again, some of those things, you're inventing ways to record things has been well documented as you're doing it. This is the, There's no roadmap for many of the, the paths you've taken. And I think we're all better off for it. So with that in mind, as I wind this down, I mean, it's, it's an archaic question. You've probably been asked it a million times. And every time you've been asked it, maybe it's changed based on when you were asked. But young guy coming up in the industry now is thinking he wants to be the next Frank Filippetti. It's a two-part question. Is there a next Frank Filippetti? Meaning, can, is there an is the industry as diverse and opportunistic as it was when you were coming up where someone's going to be able to do this, supporting themselves for the rest of their life? And if they are, what advice do you give them? Well, to start with, uh, not as much anymore, uh, uh, in terms of someone doing what we do, um, this is a different world. So much of it takes place on the computer now, you know, uh, when I started, we were working in studios with musicians and so forth. That isn't happening so much anymore. That's not to say nobody's doing it, sure. but I'm saying, uh, um, also in talking with a lot of kids, uh, who are coming up and I'd love to talk to them because I love inspiring them if I can. Um, and, uh, teaching is one of my favorite things to do. Um, and, uh, I, I love doing that, but there's not an appreciation, even from people that go to the, the, you know, the music schools and so forth. There's not a lot of appreciation for the history. 
Hmm. Um, there's not a lot of appreciation for the analog way. And if you don't know analog, I'm sorry, you're going to mess up digital because hmm. <clears throat> analog, the most important thing analog can teach you is gain structure. And when you work in digital, you don't, you don't worry about that as much and you should because gain structure is one of the most important things where each step on into each bus and into each uh, module the level that's going in and coming out so there's a lot of history that that's not being done i did a um uh at the uh, at, in lowell mass the uh, music program at uh UMass and Lowell Mass, uh, I did a, uh, a talk there, and I spent the whole talk talking about Frank Zappa. And I played them a couple things, and at the end of the class or the session, they said, a couple people came up to me and said, wow, boy, thank you so much for introducing me to this Frank Zappa guy. He is unbelievable. <laughs> And, mm. well, you know, I appreciated that, but the other side of me is saying, now, this is a music student. This isn't, this isn't like you're, you know, uh, uh, you know, run of the mill person just listening on the radio. This is someone in music doesn't know Frank Zappa. Mm. So I don't know that there's either a wish or desire, uh, nowadays. It's like, you know, the doctors today, you can. Everything you go for, you know, uh, it's a specialist. You know, there's a guy for this part of the arm, a guy for this part, a guy for, the, and a woman for this part, and another one for, and it's like, you know, and then I just say, look, you know, can you just check this whole thing? Well, I can't do beyond this spot because this is all, you know, this is where my, I just want, you know, someone who has an overall, the general practitioner, the guy that used to have your entire, medical history right in front of them yeah. and could say, oh, I see you're taking this medication for your heart, but you know, that may be related to your prostate problem. You know, I don't know. So I think there's some of that happening here too. We have now such specific genres. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I remember back 15 years ago, maybe 10, no, probably 15 I would get asked to mix a single and then I'd have to mix it for MOR and then AOR. And then I'd have to mix it for the rock stations, you know, because the, the, the guitar solo in the middle had to be softer for the MOR station, but it could be louder, you know, but I mean, we're getting there now, you know, with all it, there's not just hip hop anymore. There's like 10 genres in hip hop. There's not just, you know, uh, metal anymore. There's 10 genres of metal. So it keeps getting more and more specialized, which means people start spending more time in a smaller universe. Mm. But for me, working in the, the big universe always helps. My working with a full orchestra helped me immensely with working with corn. It's a, it's, it, there's things that you learn about the way instruments sound and the way the emotion comes out that, that is relevant to everything. Hmm. So my last question, and this will be impossible to answer, but I'm going to ask it anyway. If you could listen to any one of your records that you've worked on, if you could, that could be the only record you listen to for the rest of your life. Do you have one that you've worked on? That would be the one you'd listen to. I have one. Uh, I have, well, I have three really that kind of made me fair. What's that? <laughs> That's fair. You can have three instead of one. What would the three uh, be? I want to know what love is, uh, was the first one that put me on the map. Um, uh, uh, Eternal Flame kind of put me on the map. Wow. Um, Bangles. and Hourglass, uh, James Taylor, James Taylor, line them up, um, which I get, uh, I get, I still to this day get, um, emails from people saying it's what they use to tune their studio, you know, line them up. So, um, <clears throat> I love those, but I would not want to have just those three th songs, <laughs> you know, <clears throat> I start 
uh, at least once a week, I put on Everybody Wants to Rule the World. I didn't record it. I didn't mix it. But it's a brilliant track, you know? Yeah. There are just there are so many songs that I love, not only of mine, but of other people. I could never, I could never wind it down, really. All right. Well, then I promise, since I've already said it, that this is the last question. Let's see. Is there anything, as you look back, if you could, you would go back and do it differently? Could be anything. Could be a record. Could be a, a relationship. Could be anything career-related where you're like, you know, oh, maybe well, I'd have tried a different path. Not regretfully, well, but maybe just no, hindsight. Well, if there's anything I could do differently, it would have been to spend more time with my kids. Mm. I mean, the the you know, I have a couple of regrets uh, on some relationships. Uh, I have one that's that still bothers me. I have, uh, but more importantly than anything else, is when I look back uh, and see pictures and and I, I get to hang out with my kids, I wished I'd have had, you know, you do this, I do this. We know we don't get weekends, you know, <laughs> and there's just you know, uh, and and usually we don't even get supper time, you know. So it's like there's so much of my kids' lives that I wish that I could have been there for. Um, I think it's probably, uh, uh, at least in this country, a universal male trait. You know, you look back, you know, in your 50s, 60s, and 70s and say, man, my one real regret is my kids not being there for them as much. Um, but I had a, a wonderful uh, experience last week. It was Father's Day. And my daughter... Uh, my younger daughter, who's totally brilliant, as is my older daughter, but she had posted on LinkedIn uh, a Father's Day thing about me, about the things that I taught her. Mm. And uh, I just, I broke up. I couldn't. And it just made me realize that there's so many people like us who wonder if we've ever, we ever really made a difference in our kids lives you know uh if it was all just mom and and to know that uh that you did it was pretty special yeah I, that's that's a whole we could do six or seven hours of a podcast on that yeah um, <laughs> i can tell cool. you that right now i i can i can say um from someone on the outside looking in, I mean, I'm in a fortunate position where I get to talk to you and we, we get to work together. But I, as a fan, uh, ironically, um, our paths came into being because, as you know, um, Toontrack doesn't really do anything we don't want to do. And we don't work with anyone we don't want to work with. That's one of the beautiful things about being us. Um, and the the reality is, is I am a fan of your work. I am a the things you have done have resonated in my life. And I know that they've resonated in countless other people's lives. So just, I don't ever, I am certain you've had a, a lot of love thrown at you over the years. Some of it, uh, you know, meaningful and some of it just to get you to do what people want you to do. But beyond the shadow of a doubt, know that uh, you have made a difference. The music you've worked on has made a difference. Uh, it's just, it is beyond conversation. And 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 I, I wanted to end with that because I think it's, you know, we started this podcast off presuming anyone tuning in understands who you are already. And I, I, I think that's probably lost on you too. You know, my big question would be, do your kids even give a shit about what you did? It's funny. We work with rock stars and royalty all day long. And then your kids are like, oh, that's kind of cool. You know, my dad just does this thing. He does. You, you, you think it's impressive because it's impressive to you because you're still a fan, right? I mean, that's why we stay doing this. We're fans of what we do. And then your kids are like, yeah, I can't really explain what my dad does. He, you know, he works with people and stuff. It's like, I don't, I don't really get it, but he works on music or does something. So uh, it, you are, a, you are a treasure to the industry and we are grateful for you. Uh, we, we can't say enough good things about you. And I, you know, podcasts, it, we are doing this podcast uh, for the people that obviously love our products and help them do what they do. But we don't ever want this to be about that. We just don't want it to be about these cool people. And like I said at the beginning, you're one of the coolest cats on the planet. So we're grateful, again, that you had some time for us today because, quite frankly, I could keep this thing going for another six or seven hours. I mean, I, 
I could talk ad infinitum and ask dumb questions about stupid things that nobody but you and I care about. And one day I probably <laughs> will. But from all of us here, man, I we just we love you and yours. And if we're just grateful to be counted in your number. So thank you for your time today. Well, thank you so much, Rick. I really appreciate it. Um, it's it's nice to know uh every once in a while that yeah, that you have made a difference. And uh I've been so lucky that, I mean, the music I've worked on has made a difference, but only because of the people I work with who write the music that really makes the difference. And I've been lucky enough to work with those people. And uh, um, I look back on things now, and I'm still doing it, thankfully, uh, still having a ball doing it. And um um, I'm working now on an album of uh, Indian music, wow. uh, artist Ela Paliwal, and it's just phenomenal. And um, it's another avenue, you know, for me is this is something I hadn't worked on before, and I absolutely adore it. And thank, thankfully, I can wake up every day and uh, get a charge out of what I'm doing. So that's incredible. And I'm going to leave you with this story. So here's something you didn't know internally. You'll laugh at this. So most people watching this realize we've, uh, at Tune Track, we've worked with Frank, amazing library stories. It's incredible. And if you haven't checked it out, you're an idiot. And I mean that sincerely. In a Christian way, you're an idiot. You need to go <laughs> check it out. So, um, but... The the challenges we had behind the scenes, not in the actual recording of the process, and just the timeline, because we started talking to Frank about working with us prior to the pandemic, right at That's the cusp right. of when things were, we had no idea what was going to happen. But the, the, what Frank, what I want you to know is internally, when your name came up, we all got super excited. And I said, okay, we're going to work with Frank Phil Petty now myself. And you know Damien and you know Norman because yeah. you worked with them. When Norman lit up and he said, well, Frank Filippetti, he went down a list of albums you had worked on that weren't the ones I went down. I went, wait a minute. I went, no, it's, <laughs> I went, these ones, these ones. And then Damien chimed in, no, no, you guys, it's these, these. So my point is, is three different guys, one from Germany, one from the UK, and one from the States here, all in love with your music and the things you've had a chance to work on, all had completely different lists on why they wanted to work with you. <laughs> And I think that in and of itself is really the most beautiful compliment I could ever pay to your career is that, and again, Damian Norman and I have, we do not listen, we do not share the same musical taste in anything. Um, the only thing that we ever have in common is we know when people make great music and when they're just, you know, folks. So the highest compliment I can pay is we were all excited to work with you for very, very different reasons. And, uh, that I think is again, that's probably the the biggest testament I can give to your career. So again, just thank you. Um, I know I said I was going to end this a while ago, but I could. Uh, I want to just drag this out for everyone and everyone in home is enjoying it anyway. If you haven't left already and you're still here, it's because you're just enjoying it. So it's almost over. You'll be able to go back to whatever time wasting mm -hmm. phone computer thing you were doing beforehand right. anyway. So, but um, we'll hopefully we'll get a chance to talk to you again soon. Everyone, uh, we'll have links in the description of this to you know, obviously your discography stuff you've worked on, all that other stuff. But again, from us here to you and yours, you are loved and appreciated, and we are grateful you took some time out for us today. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Rick, and and to the rest of the crew. Uh, I loved working on the tune track thing. That's uh, that's uh, again one of my highlights was being able to record drums for three weeks. <laughs> <laughs> it's like I like I described you at the beginning. It's like making a record and then the rest of the band never shows up. Only the drummer and the producer show up. It's the greatest scenario you could have. Okay, here I am. You heard it here. Uh, uh, first, second, third, last. It doesn't matter. We just spent some time with everybody's best friend, Frank Filippetti, and we are grateful for it. We're grateful for you and the fact that you had time to spend with us. We hope you're doing well. We're looking forward to seeing you on the next Sound Horizons podcast brought to you by Toontrack. I have no idea who the next guest is because I'm not that important. I don't need to know those things. But next week, same bat time, same bat channel, we'll be back with another amazing human being. Will they be as amazing as Frank Filippetti? I don't know. You're going to have to tune in to find out. 
could just be me doing home movies for all you know. I mean, it could just be you could get Rick rolled in the best way possible. Just show up and me showing pictures of a family trip from when I was five. We won't know till next week. But regardless, we are grateful for you. Have a wonderful rest of your day, folks. We look forward to seeing you tune, tune, soon, tune. Well, tune kind of goes with what we do. We look forward to seeing you tune soon. How's that? Thanks. We'll talk to you soon.